so I earned. The one who loves me got the thousand pine points. Nate G. But good try, second place. What do you think this is? This isn't the Gospels where the last shall be first and the first shall be last. The first will be first here on the Pine Creek YouTube channel. Hope you guys are having a good day. Uh, you know how Mormons, they kind of, especially the young ones, like 13, 14, teenage Mormons, when they look at the Book of Mormon, they have some automatic respect for it when they're raised in the Mormon household. They have a reverence for the Book of Mormon. Why is that? Well, it's partly because of their culture, the way they were raised, that, that this is a special book and you should revere it. You should treat it as special. Well, the same goes for the New Testament and the Old Testament, the Older Testament, <laughs> uh, for Christians. And so my goal for this video is not to have Christians, um, not to change Christians' minds, but to help the Christian understand a guy like me and maybe just have, fu have fun thinking about different hypotheses. So that's why I titled this video, If the Gospel of Mark Was Fiction, if it was, if it were, if it was, if it were fiction, this is maybe how the author of that gospel did it. And I spent a lot of time on this video. I, I probably spent the most, no, I, I did a video on uh, the first century Mark uh, debacle. And I spent a lot of time on that one, but this is probably a second place because what I did is I color coded the whole Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Mark is really, really important because it's the, the first gospel written according to most scholars, most New Testament historians. And so if I could show that the, the, the First gospel is mostly fiction, then the other gospels kind of just fall by the wayside. So this is how I color-coded it. Anything you see pink is a quotation straight from the Old Testament. Now, if we're talking about history or fiction, I think an author quoting the Old Testament is not really describing something that actually happened in the past. So I think we're okay there. I think most Christians would say, yeah, Doug, I can see that. They're just quoting something in the Old Testament. It's not something that actually happened uh, in the first century, uh, for example. Uh, now, the second one was I coded in red, and those are parables. Now, you could say in history, a guy named Jesus told these parables, but the parables themselves are not actually something that happened in history. So I think, again, Christians would be on my side and would say, yeah, Doug, I agree with you. Uh, quoting the Old Testament is not representing something that actually happened in the first century, and parables are not actually something that happened in the first century, so we're good to go. Now, this is where I think Christians and guys like me start to diverge. We start to go in opposite directions. And that is uh, when I color-coded everything in the Gospel of Mark purple that had Mimesis, Old Testament mimesis. What's mimesis? It's basically, it's more than just imitation. It's taking ideas and common themes from the Old Testament and sometimes reversing them, doing the opposite. Um, sometimes it's just similar. Sometimes it's pretty much spot on. And, um, and so the author of the Gospel of Mark could have used Old Testament mimesis or imitation to create a narrative. Now, some Christians will push back hard against this, just like they push back hard uh, on, um, you know, Osiris or other uh, dying and rising gods. But smart Christians won't push back on this. And here's the reason why. Because, well, for example, let's look at Mike Winger. He has a channel where he has a, a series on finding Jesus in the Old Testament. And it's, it's pretty powerful stuff. 
And so if you push back on Old Testament mimesis, what you're really doing is you're pushing back on Christians like Mike Winger, who says that you can find Jesus in the Old Testament. And I agree with Mike. But I would say, a guy like me would say, that you could also find Moses in the New Testament. You can find Elijah in the New Testament. You can find Elisha in the New Testament. And this is called Old Testament mimesis where an author could have written fiction by using themes, ideas, narratives found in the Old Testament. So I color code that in violet. By the way, I think this is the best way to um, talk about the minimal facts argument with Christians, <laughs> that you bring up this Old Testament mimesis, and it basically, what you're doing is you're taking a sledgehammer to the foundation of the Gospels, and it just all comes crumbling down. Now, this is where we will diverge even more. And uh, I color-coded certain things in green, and that's fulfilled prophecies. Now, this is where guys like me will hear people screaming at me, Doug, you just have these stupid presuppositions against miracles. Stop it. Just stop it already. Why can't you just open your mind? And be open to the idea that God is real and God does miracles and he fulfills prophecy. Fair enough. That could be possible. That could be even maybe even probable in some cases. I don't think so. Now, why would a guy like me give gospels, the, the gospels, the benefit of the doubt when it comes to fulfilling prophecies when there's an explanation that in any other case, the Christians would agree with me? If there were prophecies in a different religion other than Christianity and there was an explanation for it other than uh, a God that you don't think even exists did it, why wouldn't you take that explanation? So I labeled everything in green that was a fulfillment of prophecy. In other words, that I'm viewing as, now I, you don't have to agree with me, but I'm viewing as an author just using, let's say, Isaiah 53 taking his pencil and writing it in to make it fit. And then finally, everything that you'll see in brown is all the stuff that I think Christians would vehemently disagree with me. By the way, when I say me, I mean <laughs> um, guys like Cam Spires, guys like Camille Greger, who really helped me a, a lot on uh, these ideas. And then you got professionals who do this for a living. Uh, maybe I'll leave a... Um, yeah, maybe later, like, like Brody, Dennis McDonald. I'll put a, a list later after this video. But the things in brown is probably the most contentious where you start looking at different types of uh, non-biblical mimesis, like using Homer, um, literary devices that what a Christian would say, this happened in history, a guy like me would say, no, this is irony, this is foreshadowing. This is a literary device. And there's other outside sources. One other thing I want to uh, say to, to prep this is the people who wrote the Gospels, they were educated, probably. They wrote pretty high-level Greek, and they probably learned how to write, read and write Greek by reading classics. And some of the classics back then included Homer's, uh, the Odyssey, the Iliad. And so these ideas were in their mind, these themes, these characters were in their mind when they wrote the Gospels. The Old Testament, um, think about the person you know the best that knows the Old Testament the best. The authors of um, the Gospels probably knew the Old Testament as well as, as your favorite guy, your favorite apologist, your favorite pastor. So these themes, maybe probably better. So these themes were in their mind. So uh, this is really interesting. I didn't actually um, expect anything when I first started doing this, but I started noticing some patterns. And so what I did was, let me get rid of myself here. This is the Gospel of Mark copied and pasted into Microsoft Word and it's all in black. Now, don't worry about some of it's bolded, some of it's not. Just ignore that. 
but it's all in black. This is the whole gospel, all 16 chapters of Mark in black. Now, if, when I bring up the color key again, uh, well, no, I'll start with, uh, with pink. Pink is referencing Old, Tas Old Testament passages. So when I put in the pink, now remember, I think we agreed at this point that this is not representing history. It's just quoting Old Testament. If I put th that in, look how much of the, old, of the Gospel of Mark is now non-history. So we have basically just an author quoting um, the Old Testament. Now the next one is, just hang on a second, I need to bring up one thing here. The next one is parables. Now parables are not representing history. The guy telling the parable might, but the actual events of a parable is not something that happened in the past in the first century. So if I were to color code red and add it in, into the Gospel of Mark, look what happens. You see that the historicity of the Gospel of Mark is now shrinking. We got quotes from the Old Testament. Now we have parables. Now the next one is the mimesis, where I would say most Christians would agree with with mimesis, but they would just say it's the Holy Spirit working throughout the Bible to have a, a common thread, a providence, pro, uh, yeah, providence. So everything in purple now that is about to come up is mimesis, mostly with First and Second Kings, but some other prophets uh, like Isaiah. And look what happens. So if mimesis is basically an author using past narratives, Old Testament narratives, to create new ones, look how much it goes from here to here. Now remember, everything in black, from my point of view, is stuff that's still history. But we've now taken out Old Testament quotations, we've taken out parables, and now we're taken, we've taken out mimesis that can very easily be explained by, and I'll go through specific examples here in a moment, but could be explained by an author just using themes and stories from the Old Testament to create new ones. Okay, the next one is where I think most Christians would disagree, the next two actually, and that is fulfilled prophecy. So whenever you, you have a prophecy like um, that the Messiah will ride in on a colt, Zechariah 9.9, I view that as basically an author just penning it in. And it actually did not happen in history. So if we put in fulfilled prophecies in green, boom, there you have it. So it went from there to there. You notice where <laughs> there's hardly any black left? There's hardly any history left. If the Gospel of Mark was fiction, this is how the author could have done it. We have one more to go, and that is uh, coding it brown, and that's for all the other outside possible sources of mimesis, non-biblical mimesis, literary devices like foreshadowing, irony, reversal of expectations. If I put that in, boom. And what we're left is with history is in black. And when you actually look at it, and we'll go through it, when you actually look at it, you basically have a story of a guy who had some disciples and he died. And that's it. And he died from, um, he was persecuted and died, crucified. And that's basically it. So it goes from, I should make a, um, what do you call it, a, a gif, a gif? <laughs> goes from this potentially all being history, remove the Old Testament quotes, remove the parables, remove the mimesis, uh, remove the prophecies, and then remove um, all the literary styles, uh, non-biblical mimesis, mimesis like Homer, and you're left with very, very little. Okay, let's bring myself back here. Now, what do you think the response would be from a Christian watching this? <laughs> My guess is the response is not going to be not good. Um, but 
I want to assure the Christian that you go ahead and keep believing that it's all history, but I'm, I'm showing, I, sh I show this to you so that you can understand why a lot of people, a lot of non-Christians, don't view the Gospels as history. That when you read it, just because the Gospels say something, it's probably not true. It's probably did not happen in the past for all those five major reasons I gave represented by five different colors. Okay, um, how am I going to do this? The Gospel of, of uh, Mark is the shortest Gospel, but it's still 16 chapters. And so maybe I'm going to try to do one minute per chapter and just fly through this, and then you can go back, and I have it all footnoted. Oh, one other thing. I wanted to show something else here. Just to show that with the mimesis that a lot of Christians don't push back on what I'm saying here at all. This is from the Gospel Coalition, which is a very evangelical, conservative type of Christianity. And they admit, uh, this is from Bruce Waltke back in 2009, the Gospel Coalition. El Elisha is a type of Christ and his disciples. So this is a Christian speaking. Both are designated by a prophet, whom General Populus recognized as a true prophet. Both received their spirit on the other side of the Jordan. Um, Jesus and uh, Elisha are surrounded by more disciples than their predecessors. They're itinerant miracle workers. They give life in the land of death. They cleanse uh, lepers. They heal the sick. They defy gravity, uh, walking on water, and so forth. Reverse death by raising dead sons, restoring their mothers, help widows, feed the hungry, minister to the Gentiles, prepare to sit at a table with sinners, led captives. So this is a Christian guy showing all the parallels between Elisha and Jesus Christ. Now, the Christian would say, this is amazing. Look how God and the Holy Spirit works throughout history. But a guy like me would say, oh, what an amazing author that he knew his stuff. He knew his source material. Here's another example. This is, uh, I think, from an Orthodox Christian. Let me double check here. Uh, well, it's hard to tell. Maybe a mainline Christian, Reverend Martini, Martina, uh, Osborne or Oborn? Uh, ten similarities between Jesus and the prophet Elisha. So these, this is a Christian speaking. Um, let's see, here are ten. Their names have similar meanings. Their ministries both started in the River Jordan. They both raise a, a woman, adult son from the dead. They both feed large numbers with small quantity of food. That's a big one. They both turn a small quantity of liquid into abundance. That's another big miracle. They both heal lepers. They both make things that should sink float. They both are uh, betrayed for love and money. They both give sight to the blind. And their deaths bring new life. Uh, yes, remember, uh, what's that song? Uh, some guy touched the bones of Elijah. And there's a song about it, and he came back to life. Some dead guy touched the bones of Elijah. So, so the tomb brought life. So there's a lot of parallels between Jesus and Elisha. Uh, and Christians acknowledge this. But what they see as amazing works of God, um, I think a guy like me who values truth says, well, maybe it's an act of God, or maybe it's just an author knowing his source material. So now let's uh, look at the actual text. And I'm going to, again, I'm going to do this pretty fast. And um, let's see if I can get it up here. There we go. So um, remember, brown is basically the stuff that Christians would most likely disagree with. But basically, the beginning of the gospel, Jesus Christ, Son of God, here we have the footnotes. That's from the Priorian calendar inscription. Pink is quotes from the Old Testament, Malachi 3.1, Isaiah 43. Um, everything in purple is mimesis from the Old Testament. Uh, that comes from 2 Kings 1.8. This is a, a really good one. Um, Elijah had a garment of hair and a leather belt, and guess who else had something like that? That would be John the Baptist. So all this could not have happened in history at all. Uh, if it were fiction, this is how the author would have done it. Temptation of Jesus, purple, uh, mimesis, mimesis, mimesis. Um, 
So the first one is First Kings 19. Elijah escapes from Jezebel in the wilderness for 40 days. Uh, so did Jesus. Um, escaped into the wilderness for 40 days and was tempted by Satan. Angels gave um, Jesus food and angels gave uh, Elijah food. As Isaiah 9, 1 to 2, hope, good news for those east of the Jordan and Galilee. And that's the beginning of Elisha's ministry and the beginning of Jesus's ministry. Um, 1 Kings 19, 19, 21, a man with an unclean spirit. Uh, that's a quote from Nahum 1, 15. Um, Brown, remember, is other mimesis, other parallels, and literary devices. The miracle of exorcism, showing authority, demon only partially obeyed in verse 26, cry with a loud voice, irony, demons know, but people don't. That's a huge theme that's found in uh, Homer's uh, Odyssey um, and also found in the Gospel of Mark, where he, here you have the king of king, the lord of lords, and yet um, people don't know or shouldn't know or shouldn't tell who he is. Um, Larry Device, humor. Oh, yeah, um, Jesus healed the mother of uh, Simon so they could get food. <laughs> uh, healed the mother-in-law so she could cook supper. Irony, king of kings is hidden like Homer's uh, Odysseus. Um, and then purple is Mimesis, Isaiah 9, 1 to 2. Hope, good news for those east of Jordan and Galilee. Jesus heals the paralytic. Um, Let's see here. That's from Isaiah 35, 5 to 6. So this is basically a result of a, a, a forced fulfillment of prophecy. So notice in black, this is the first thing of history that we have here, and that is Jesus calls Levi. Maybe that happened in the past, that he had a disciple named Levi. The question about fasting, same thing. That could have happened. There could have been a guy named Jesus who talked about fasting uh, and about the Sabbath. Oh, the man with the withered hand is a good one. Maybe this didn't happen in history, but maybe maybe the author of the Gospel of Mark got it from Isaiah 35, 5 to 6, uh, 1 Kings 13, 4 to 6. King Jeroboam shriveled, had a shriveled up hand and was healed. Uh, a multitude by the seaside. Uh, we have some mimesis in brown, and we have a um, parable in red. Uh, the, the brown stuff is a literary device. Irony up here. Again, you can go back and pause this and, and read it for yourself later. Uh, Mimesis, Homer. We, here we have the twin brothers, Castor and Pollux. Uh, Dennis McDonald talked about this when he came on my channel, uh, where you have um, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, who surnamed Boanerges, that is the sons of thunder. Here we have a very clear reference to Greek mythology. And these sons of thunder were often depicted on either sides of a deity on the left and right. And remember what James and John asked Jesus at the end? Uh, can we sit to your left and to your right, just like the sons of thunder asked or are often depicted as? Here we have another parable, things that didn't happen in history, uh, and a quotation. Uh, and, and then what we have in brown are literary devices, irony. Uh, the king is a servant, a brother to the people. King of King, Lords of Lo Lord of Lords, a complete reversal of expectations. It's a literary technique. Uh, mimesis and parables. The parable of the sowers, talking about Jezebel, Ahab, and Joram. Uh, this is according to a scholar named Adam Wynn. Use of parables that could have happened in history. Purple. Jesus stills a storm. Did that Jesus actually still a storm, or is that a parable um, based on Jonah one? Uh, remember Jonah calmed a storm by basically asking the, the guys to throw him overboard and here Jesus calms a storm um, here I even have a link to learn more about that Jesus heals oh this is uh, the, the demoniac um, this one a lot of Christians will push back hard on but there is a pretty strong parallel between this story and the Cyclops on, uh, in Homer's Odyssey uh, same with the, go the girl restored to life and a woman healed. This is a good one. Um, this is uh, what's called a Markham, Markham sandwich. It's a story about a 12-year-old young girl who dies. And then Jesus is on, on his way to help this young girl who's 12 years old. And wouldn't you know it, he meets an older woman 
who's has bled for 12 years. She's menstruating for 12 years straight. Possible without dying? Maybe. I don't know. And Jesus heals her by her just touching Jesus' cloak. And then it goes right back to the other story of the daughter who's 12 years old, who Jesus heals. The use of the number 12 is not a coincidence. It's talking about maybe the 12 tribes of Israel and how the young girl represents the new Israel that comes back to life and how the old Israel has been bleeding, <laughs> hemorrhaging for 12 years and um, still alive, but Jesus is representing the new way to go through the young girl. The rejection of Jesus at Nazareth. Uh, what do I say there? Uh, literary device. Verse 1 is a setup for verse 4. Those closest to Jesus fail to understand him. Yeah, you see that irony over and over and over again, that the disciples are just idiots. Uh, also, no faith, no miracles. The mission of the Twelve. Now, this is in black, so this could have happened in history. Um, the death of John the Baptist. This is in green, which is a fulfillment of prophecy. So Jesus, like Elijah, a new prophet, Elijah is to return before the end of the age, Malachi 4, 5 to 6. Then we have Mimesis again, the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, Mimesis with 2 Kings, Mark Goodacre, Jezebel Ahab's wife, wanted Elijah dead. Also Gundry uh, notes parallels with Esther, Esther 5, 3, even half of my kingdom. There's a key, um, key phrase. Uh, remember, this is about the story of John the Baptist. Um, oh, some girl basically is promised something by the king, and she says, I want the head of John the Baptist for my mother, I think it is. And, um, but the king basically says, ask whatever you want. I'll give you anything you want, even half of my kingdom. Well, that phrase, even half of my kingdom, is found in Esther 5.3. So the author could have been aware of that and is using a form of mimesis here. Uh, the feeding of the 5,000 is found in Homer's Odyssey, and it's also found in 2 Kings 4, 42 to 44, where there you have a situation of limited food and a big crowd. And so that miracle is uh, just, you know, it's not out of thin air that the author of the Gospel of Mark, if he were writing fiction, this is where maybe he got it from. Jesus walks on water. Again, we have Mimesis with Job 9, 8 to 11, walking on the waves when he passes by. Passes by is a key phrase that's also uttered up here. He meant to pass by them. Um, and so some people think there's Mimesis here uh, from this portion of Mark going back to Job 9, um, 8 to 11. Uh, healing of the sick, uh, fulfillment of prophecy of Isaiah 35, 5 to 6. Here we have a whole bunch of quotations from the Old Testament. And then we have uh, literary devices, reversal of expectations. You know how the, in the Old Testament certain foods you, are, you can't eat, you can't have um, shellfish and, and other crustaceans. Um, but here Jesus is saying that you can eat um, other foods and that what really matters is what comes out of a person, not what goes into them. So this is a, a literary device. Um, let's see. Here's a more literary devices. Jesus wants to be hidden. He tells basically a lot of most of the people that he heals not to tell anyone. That's irony. Foreign women recognizes Jesus, but his own Jews don't. Irony. Uh, imagery of Jews' children receiving the gospel first, and then Gentiles, like, who are considered dogs. Um, irony, it seems like it um, should be the, the Jews first, adult Jews, like the Pharisees, but of course, it's a reversal of expectations. Those who knew the scriptures the best were the last ones to understand. Jesus cures the deaf man. It's a fulfillment of prophecy of Isaiah 35, 5 to 6. Feeding of the 4,000. So here we have our second feeding, uh, which is found in Homer's Odyssey and also found in... Um, 2 Kings 4, 42 to 44, demand for a sign. No sign will be given to this generation, yet Jesus has performed many signs. So this is irony. Here we have the Pharisees came and began to argue, seeking from him a sign to test him. 
And Jesus sighed deeply in spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Well, this is ironic since Jesus has spent a good portion of this gospel performing many miracles and signs and wonders. Um, and yet he's asking, why do you want more? Of course, <laughs> people want more. <laughs> Irony. Okay, so here's um, green, which is um, fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus cures a blind man. Peter's declaration about Jesus. Jesus foretells his death and resurrection. Uh, so in, in order fulfilled prophecy, Isaiah 35, 5, 6, basically that the Messiah will do miracles. Um, the second paragraph, Jesus is like Elijah, a new prophet. Elijah is to return before the end of the age, Malachi 4, 5 to 6. And fulfilled prophe prophecy from Daniel 9, 26. Oh, we're well over halfway. Transfiguration. Oh, this is interesting. Um, this is uh, a lot of mimesis here. Um, the Elijah, Elisha, and mimesis from 2 Kings 2, 11 to 12. Uh, fulfillment of prof prophecy in green. Jesus is like Elijah, a new prophet. Elijah is to return before the end of age again. The healing of a boy with a spirit. Um, this is a literary device where I think this is the story of where the disciples couldn't do something, but uh, Jesus could. And so it's a literary device. The disciples are clueless, unable to understand or do miracles. He, they couldn't heal this boy, uh, which is similar to 2 Kings 4.31, where Elisha's disciple Gehazi fails to heal the boy, but Elisha could. Here the disciples could failed to heal the boy, but Jesus could. Uh, literary device, the whole miracle was a setup to demonstrate the need for strong belief in verse 23 and prayer 45. Uh, Jesus foretells his death and resurrection. Remember, green is fulfillment of prophecy. From Daniel 9, 26, the chosen one will be killed. 2 Kings 2, Elijah ascending into heaven. Uh, who is the greatest? This is um, a literary device. Irony, reversal of expectations. The first will be last. The last will be first. Um, and all this in purple is mimesis from Numbers 11, 26 to 29. Uh, Jesus talks about divorce. That could have happened in history. There's a lot of quotations from the Old Testament here that's, you know, not referring to anything historical, just quoting the Old Testament. Jesus blesses the little children. Here we have a literary, literary device again, irony, reversal of the social order, reversal of expectations, let the children come to me. The rich man, uh, quoting the scripture, but here again we have a literary device, irony, reversal of the expectations. The whole story of the rich man is a setup for the author to make a point in verse 21 and verse 20, uh, 31. So what's in verse 21? It's a setup for this, that Jesus looking upon him loved him and said, you lack one thing, go and sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. This is mimesis with 2 Kings 4 to 7, like the widow who was instructed to sell oil and pay your debts. The rich man was told to also sell his position and pay the poor. This is according to uh, scholar Roth. Um, fulfillment of prophecy in green, third time Jesus foretells his death and resurrection. From Isaiah 50, verse 6, Hosea 6, verse 2. Here we have the, oh, but this was what I was talking about earlier, um, that we have some Hellenistic uh, themes. We have some Greek mythology influ influences here of James and John being known as the sons of thunder, like the, the identical twins that are in the um, um, constellation. And they are often depicted in history as sitting on both sides of a deity. And what do they ask? Teacher, um, we, want, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And James and John said, grant us to sit one at your right and one at your left in glory. This is also maybe foreshadowing for what we see later on with Jesus on the cross with the two criminals on either side of him. So Jesus, this is irony, right? Jesus says no to his beloved disciples. You can't get what you want. You can't be on either side of me. However, these two criminals were. It's showing that Jesus is the man of the people. Um, yeah, uh, twin brothers, Castor and Pollux, often depicted on each side of a deity. See uh, Dennis McDonald's work. Irony, reversal of expectations, a king to serve, uh, not a king to rule. Um, and then the fulfillment of prophecies from Isaiah, Isaiah 53. Like Isaiah 53 has always um, been heralded as a great, great prophecy. 
And, um, but a guy like me would just say, well, maybe the author, if this were fiction, maybe the author just penciled it in. The Healing of uh, Blind Bartimaeus, Fulfillment of Prophecy, uh, Isaiah 35, 5, 6, Fulfilling Prophecy of Zechariah 9, 9. That's, this is the one that actually caused me a lot of tr trouble when I was a Christian, where it became pretty clear that the whole story of Jesus going, the triumphant entry of Jesus being on one cult or two cults, seems like Matthew and Mark couldn't get their story straight, whether it was one or two, and it seemed like, oh, these authors just didn't quite understand what Zechariah 9 and 9 was saying, and it was a forced prophecy. It was making the prophecy fit, and that really caused me difficulties when I was a Christian because it became clear to me at that point that, that the prophecy of Ze Zechariah 9 and 9 that we're seeing here was just written in by the author and probably did not happen in the past. And I tell you, once you consider that possibility or that plausibility in this case, it's, to me it seemed very plausible, your whole foundation for what you believe crumbles very, very quickly. Jesus curses the fig tree. Oh, this is the one that Camp Spires... Um, uh, made me aware of a couple years back, and um, it it's amazing how many Christians think that Jesus saw a fig tree and he cursed it and it died, and he went into a temple and caused a ruckus, and didn't get arrested, <laughs> and that um, and then he gives a lesson of the fig tree, but you notice here that what is actually happening is a literary technique, and it probably none of this happened in the past. It's a mark and sandwich or inclusio. The fig tree is the temple and the sacrificial practices that happened back then, which are no longer in season because Jesus is here. Jesus replaces all that stuff with faith, prayer, and prayer and belief. So why is it a sandwich? Because we have this temple being sandwiched between two fig tree narratives there and there. So we have a sandwich going on, a literary technique. Does that mean this is impossible that this didn't happen in the past? Of course not. It could have happened in the past. But it's more likely that it didn't. Jesus' authority question. This I left in black. This could have actually happened in history. The parable of wicked tenants. Well, that, a parable is a parable. It didn't happen in the past. Quotation, Old Testament. Uh, question about paying taxes. Um, a literary technique. Irony. The Pharisees in the story think they are lying but they're actually telling the truth. Uh, what, what do they think they're lying about? They sent him, the, some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to entrap Jesus in his talk. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and care for no man. For you do not regard the position of man, but truly teach the way of God. Now these Pharisees, they're lying here, right? But here's the irony. They think they're lying, but within the context of the story, they're telling the truth. It's brilliant writing from a brilliant author um, who wrote this gospel. Is it lawful, lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And this is a great setup for, you know, um, Jesus is, is on your heart, so you give your life to who, whoever, whoever is on the inscription. And, and in Christianity... Jesus fills you. He owns you. So you pay. You got to pay him back by taking up your cross and following him. Uh, quotations. We have some history here. I didn't uh, highlight it. So what's history? Uh, questions about the resurrection from Sadducees. The first commandment: love others. So a man named Jesus could have said that. Uh, the question about David's son. Jesus denounces the scribes. That's like something that could have happened in the past. Okay, now here we have more mimesis, but not from the Bible uh, and literary um, techniques. Mimesis with rabbinic literature, ancient Greek writings, and Buddhist tradition. Oh, this is the walking on the water one. Um, no, no, this is the, the, uh, the poor woman giving everything she had. This is found in many other uh, religious texts. Uh, Vespasian ordered that two copper coins be paid to the Temple of Jupiter in Rome um, in 70 AD. So maybe there's some of that going on here because of this phrase, two copper coins. 
Now, again, this could have all happened in the past. If you're a Christian listening, it could have happened. Or this could have been an author using mimesis, using uh, these themes and similarities of other texts to create a narrative. The destruction of the temple foretold, foretold um, literary technique, foreshadowing, an event that has already ta taken place. Most scholars think that the Gospel of Mark was written um, near 70 AD or maybe just before, just after. There's no reason to assume uh, a miracle of prophecy, a miracle of prediction, um, if you don't need to. Unless you need Christianity for your <laughs> hope, meaning, and purpose, and, and to avoid hell, then I guess you kind of do. But uh, Pink is quoting Old Testament, not history. We have some uh, black here. Coming of the Son of Man, quoting uh, the Old Testament. Lesson of the fig tree, parable, didn't happen in the past. Uh, necessity of watch, watchfulness. Uh, we have some mimesis or literary device foreshadowing. Times named here correspond to the times of the passion narrative. Oh, yeah, this is interesting. Watch, therefore, that you... Um, the, Jesus is talking about the end times, but the times he gives is very interesting. For you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or at cock crow or in the morning. And if you remember the story of Jesus... Um, the events of the Passion happen in the same order, evening, midnight, cock crow, remember Peter, um, and then the crucifixion in the morning. Uh, Mimesis, the anointing of Bethany, from 2 Kings 9, 1 to 13. More literary devices, foreshadowing, betrayal, irony. Jesus needed to be identified after causing a commotion in the temple and healing so many people. Yeah, Christians, have you ever wondered about that? Have you ever wondered why Jesus needed to be recognized or um, that he needed to be kissed by Judas in order to be recognized as he's the one when he's the one who's been teaching and preaching in the, near the temple, in the temple, throwing things up in the air in the temple, healing people? Um, irony. So here we have a bunch of literary devices foreshadowing Jesus' death. Uh, Jesus' closest disciple, Peter, um, uh, denounces him, which is the reverse of Elisha and Elijah. Remember, um, Elisha basically says to Elijah three times. Elijah needs to go to three different places. Uh, do I, did I write it down here? Maybe it's first, yeah, First Kings 19, 1 to 5. I think that's right. Maybe it's not. But basically, Elisha is told by Elijah three times, I need to go such and such a place, stay here. Elijah says, no, I will follow you. Second time, I need to go here. Elijah, Elisha says, no, I'm going to follow you. Elijah says, stay here. I need to go there. Elijah, Elisha says, no, I'm going to go with you. So he affirms Elijah. He follows Elijah. He goes with Elijah three times. And Peter does the exact opposite. Coincidence? Actually, most Christians say, no, it's, this is God working throughout the story. Or it's just a form of mimesis. So most of this I labeled as brown. Um, literary technique, Jesus betrayed by one of his disciples. Uh, why? The need to identify someone who taught, healed. Yeah, we talked about that. Here we have mimesis. Peter denies Jesus. Jesus before Pilate. The mimesis here is the reversal of expectations with 2 Kings 2, 1 to 12. Elisha's triple refusal to leave Elijah. Oh, that's what I was just talking about. Um, mimesis with Daniel 6. Like Pilate, Darius... Oh, I spelled that wrong. Darius was reluctant to put Daniel in the lion's den, but feels forced to. So there's similarities between Darius and Daniel in the lion's den and Pilate and Jesus with the crucifixion. Is this uh, God's providence or is this an uh, author knowing his Old Testament well? Soldiers mock Jesus. I labeled that in brown because this is a type of literary device. Again, most of um, Mark's gospel is <laughs> it's full of irony, reversal of expectation. Jesus is not hailed as a king, but rather mocked and dressed up as a false king by the Roman soldiers. So here we have Roman soldiers actually, within the context of the story, um, thinking that there's, they're mocking, but they're really dressing up a true king. That's irony. Uh, fulfilling a prophecy 2218 
Uh, oh yeah, right here. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots. Sound familiar? That's from Psalm 22, 18, casting out lots for the, for the garments. Did this happen in history? Maybe. Or maybe the author just knew Psalms 22, 18 and penciled it in. The death of Jesus, who we quotation from the Old Testament, mimesis, um, and fulfillment of prophecy. The mimesis is from McDonald, uh, no, that's, oh, Psalm 22, no, I don't have the correct mimesis here from Kings. But um, McDonald from Homer's, the Iliad, Priam getting the body of his son Hector is very similar to um, the body of Jesus being gotten by Joseph of Arimathea. Okay. Oh, we're almost done. So the resurrection of Jesus. Well, here we have a literary device. Irony, male disciples flee, but the women stay. Irony, women don't tell anyone, implying that Jesus is forgotten. So if someone's reading the story and they're going, hey, I don't remember this. I don't remember Jesus healing this person. I don't remember Jesus, this tomb, whole, this tomb idea. If people in the first or second century are reading this and saying, I don't remember this. Well, the reason why you don't remember it, you folks, is because Jesus told everyone to be quiet. Shh, don't tell anyone. Uh, and then we have uh, Mimesis in 2 Kings 13, 20 to 21. Both Elijah and Jesus have a life-giving tomb where people flee. Yeah, read that. That's the, the bones of Elijah that have certain power. And it caused people to rise. And then, uh, this is not brown, but it's yellowish. This all should not even, even be in uh, the book of Mark, according to many scholars. Um, but some Christians disagree with that. So, that was, in a nutshell, why I think, and many other people think, that most of the Gospel of Mark is pure fiction. Now, Christians, you go ahead, keep believing that most of it's fact and history, if not all. But if you want to understand why people like me um, don't think it's history, and why when you bring up, let's say, the minimal facts argument, we just kind of go, ugh, like this is a story. And if you, a lot of people have come late, so I want to show something. This is the Gospel of Mark, uh, as is, in um, copied and pasted into Microsoft Word. And now, if I subtract by taking everything that's um, an Old Testament quote and saying that's not history, that goes away. If I take away all the parables, saying, well, that didn't actually happen in history, that goes away. Then if I take all the Old Testament mimesis and say, you know, what's more likely, that this actually happened in the past, or that an author just used the Old Testament, um, like Elijah and Elisha, to create a narrative, then that goes away. Then if I say, well, you know what, I, 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 there could be a God, miracles could be possible, uh, they could have happened, but I'm not going to assume that that's the case when there's other explanations. So maybe the, um, all these prophecies that came to fruition were just penciled in by the author. If I call that green, label it as green, that goes away. And then finally, if we take the look at the context of the, the time, look at all the writings, the, the Greek and um, other writings of the time, if we look at literary techniques, and label that brown, that goes away. We're now left with a gospel of Mark where almost all of it is fiction. You're left with basically a guy, an itinerant preacher, maybe, had some disciples, maybe, was crucified, maybe. Now, maybe um, guys like Camille and Cam can put in the comments later um, a long, long list of PhDs <laughs> who basically agree with most of the stuff I've said here. And show that I'm just not making this stuff up. But I honestly think this is the way one needs to battle things like the minimal facts arguments. Because the whole idea of minimal, minimal facts just 
crumbles if we're talking about Star Wars. It just crumbles if we're talking about um, um, Chronicles of Narnia. So if you want to push back hard <laughs> on the minimal facts argument, this is how you do it. You focus on things like mimesis, imitation, that, and fulfilled prophecy that what is more likely? Now, if you have no skin in the game, if you don't care about Jesus, if you don't care about going to heaven or hell, <laughs> if you don't care about getting your meaning, purpose, and hope from this religion, then of course you're going to see it this way, right? You're going to see this mimesis. You're going to see that these are parables. You're going to see that these are penciled in prophecies. But if you're a person who has thinks that they've seen a ghost or thinks that they've seen an exor a real exorcism or thinks that they've seen a real miracle, then everything changes for you, right? Now this mimesis business becomes, oh, this is God working throughout history. We need exactly zero books written on any level of academic expertise to tell us that Superman's superpowers aren't real. Okay, I'm going to take questions, if there are any. I've been not focusing on the chat. Trevor Lund, uh, you should add a final multi-page slide where all these color-coded sections are white out, leaving only the few black. Hey, great idea, Trevor. But that's more work for me, right? <laughs> but that's a good idea. Instead of uh, just changing the color, getting rid of them, and so just having it black. Oh, yes. Um, Cam, why don't you put your Discord? Cam Spires has a Discord server called... Uh, what's it called, Cam? Where he talks about a lot of these things. We talked about last night. Cam and I were there last night with a group of about half a dozen really smart people. Like all the smart kids hang out in Cam's server. And, um, and the cool kids, too. Smart and cool. Cam's server is called on Discord Academic Biblical Criticism. I think you need an inv invite for that, though. Pine Creek, are you going to make the color document available online? That's a good question. Am I going to? Am I going to make this? I'm going to give this first to uh, my friends Cam Spires and Camille Gregor first to correct any mistakes that I might have made because I'm not perfect. And then maybe, yeah, maybe uh, we'll put this online somewhere and people can keep adding onto it. Um, there's probably a lot of things that non-Christians, scholars would say, well, no, this is not mimesis. This is a literary device, but I wouldn't say this is mimesis. Um, so they might change the colors that I chose. Oh, okay, Cam has an invite link in there. Nick Jr., that was my kid's favorite um, TV station at one point. If this does establish Mark as likely fi fiction, doesn't this cast the other Gospels in serious doubt as historically reliable? Yes. Mark and priority. So, in fact, what I just did to, with the Gospel of Mark can be done to the unique parts of the Gospel of Matthew and Luke and John. So this is why this is the absolute death knell to certain forms of Christianity. I would even say liberal forms of Christianity. Um, the only type of Christianity that could survive this is like the John Dominic Crossan type Christianity or the Dennis McDonald type Christianity where these are just uh, philosophies of life, passivism and so forth. But yeah, uh, what is it? Matthew borrows, what, 50, 60%, 70% from Luke? I mean, I mean, from Mark? So again, if you're a Christian listening, please feel free to go on believing that all this is history. But if you want to communicate and have a civil relationship with guys like me, 
then I think it helps you to put yourself in my mindset and say, okay, if the Gospel of Mark was fiction, how in the world would the author come up with this stuff? The purpose of this video is to show how the author of Mark could have come up with this stuff. And it's not rocket science. It's just being a good writer, a very good writer. The, the author of the Gospel of Mark was brilliant, in my opinion. Salim asks, uh, besides a miracle, what would convince you of Christianity? Uh, I like uh, Camille's answer to that. Um, a first century dated gospel found in a lava pit in Central America. Dated to first century, talking about all the things Mark, Matthew, Mark, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John talk about. That would be pretty brilliant. Taylor asks, why am I not a nihilist? I don't know. I love life too much. Do you doubt subjective morals being valid? Uh, sure, there could be objective morality, but I don't think so. Hi, Adam. Hypothetically, what would the historical information in the Gospels have to look like to raise your confidence? It is God's word to say 50 out of 100. Um, I would say more diverse, like writings from Pilate, writings from Chinese people, writings from uh, the Americas. It's something similar to having historical Gospels throughout the planet that before there was even sailboats going to other continents. Um, Aben Gerd Nurgle, Matthew Borrow's 46 uh, verbatim material from Mark. Yeah, I, my first guess was 50. Can you hear that jet flying by? Luca, Pine Creek, will you get Dr. Josh Bowen from Digital Hammer on your channel sometimes? He's an excellent. Maybe. Um, he does such a good job on uh, Skylar Fiction's channel that I so far haven't found a need for him to be on my channel. Go to Skylar Fiction's channel and you can listen to him there. Jazzerlites, what did you think of this presentation? Yeah, there's a lot of borrowing going on between the Gospels. Could it be argued, or is it already argued, that the non-canonical Gospels employ the same literary techniques? Great question. Cam probably would know better than me, but I don't think as much. The Gospels are definitely uh, more, the Gospels and Acts are more story-filled. Uh, notice that... Um, Here's fun fact. Paul's letters, he doesn't even quote Jesus. You would think if... <laughs> this is just strange, right? Jesus, uh, Paul doesn't talk about... Jesus said, and then goes, blah, blah, blah. Doesn't talk about specific miracles that Jesus did. I think... Um, so I think the use of mimesis is still there in Paul's letters, but I think what Paul does is he takes the Old Testament and... Um, he bastardizes them and to create a new theology. Instead of salvation through repentance and forgiveness, it's salvation through grace. Now, some Christians do believe you'd have to have repentance and, um, um, in order to be saved. Other Christians don't think that. But Paul is pretty much a grace guy. Jazzerlites, I will have to look at my video again because I've been busy in the chat. Are you proselytizing in my chat? You feel free. You can proselytize all you want. Brian Stevens, I, I have grown so tired of apologists who use shady techniques to run away from backing what they really believe. It's hard to get an apologist like Jazzerlites to say what he believes. Well, I think a lot of it is people in general don't like to be trapped. And so that's why I often say, um, embrace the trap. If what you believe is true, don't fear. Don't be scared to look stupid. Don't be scared to be entrapped. Say, if Jesus is true and Christianity, the core tenets are true, what do you have to worry about? 
Just answer the best of your ability, be honest, and move on. Trevor Lenz says, so the takeaway is that Mark is less than a disciple's fan fiction than an ahistorical sham fiction. Um, <laughs> well, it's definitely, a, the purpose of Mark was to uh, get, a, get a following, get people to buy into Christianity. It was written for a purpose. Do I dare say, use the P word, propaganda? Can I bring that Mormon on? Jaws high, I think. Oh, I asked him, Salim. He said no, or he just didn't respond. I tried two times. I hate asking more than once, and I asked twice with him. Uh, you're thinking of, um, oh, what's his name? Kwa Kwa Q Kwa Kwe. But he has a great Mormon channel. If you want to get great outsider test for faith material what you want is this guy he's the guy who was on jeff durbin's channel i've had fun with him in the comment section of some of his videos but yeah quake q that's his name Jerry, I don't think you would change a guy like Jezreelite's mind at all. My guess is Jezreelite's, he, um, he would admit that he needs Christianity. And he probably has seen something amazing in his life. That he can only attribute to God and Jesus. Michelle Eggleston, any thoughts for continuing the religious conversation with someone who used to be a former cultist, then Mormon, and is now some kind of quasi-deist, non-denominational Christian? Well, um, <laughs> if someone is a quasi-deist, non-denominational Christian, uh, I would almost back off at that point because they're probably not going to do any harm in society to themselves or to others, but maybe they still will. Um, like I was a deist for a year or two. No, about a year after I left Christianity. Now, if someone really needs the idea of an all-powerful creator to start the ball rolling, to create the universe, maybe for the basis for objective morality, even though we might not know what it is, uh, fine. Like... To me, if they need that so they don't have existential angst, they really need that, that's fine. But to go from that to what I was talking about in this video, to say that what we're reading in Mark is history, the things that actually happened in the past, that's a huge giant leap. And this is where, um, you know, things like um, issues of uh, how to treat people, um, divorce, sexuality, Stuff like that. Uh, just th even the idea of being more susceptible to be conned, you know, miracles, uh, homeopathy, new age type stuff. If the person is a deist and um, or a non-denominational Christian, they're still at risk of, you know, you should think clearly about s these things and say, do I have good reasons to think this uh homeopathy potion is going to help my uh, eczema, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Taylor, is it immoral to judge an individual based on subjective morals? Is it immoral to judge uh, under a framework which allows subjective morals to be... It seems unjust to judge based upon one's subjective morality. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, here's a good idea when it comes to morality. Um, just try your best not to hurt people. Yes, I saw that Abernergal, 
Abaddon Nurgle. I forgive you, my son. Okay, it looks like the questions are winding down. Michelle, I hope that helped you. Uh, Michelle, are, are you talking about yourself or someone else? <laughs> Taylor, I think I know what you're getting at. You're basically, my guess is you're a Christian so of some sort. Maybe not. But if you are a Christian, my guess is you want people to be scared that if they leave Christianity, that they'll become a nihilist. And therefore, uh, hang on for dear life to Christianity. I don't live in Canada, Salim. I'm, I was born there. You're welcome, Michelle. My goal, Michelle, my goal on my channel is to move people from fundamentalism to more liberal version of Christianity. But, you know, lately the liberal Christians are bothering me more than the fundamentalists. <laughs> uh, because they're so wishy-washy. And then moving from liberal Christianity to just being nice to each other. Oh yes, Trevor Lynn, I forgot to have a color code for the parts of Mark that were inspired by God. Yes, good point. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. This is Say Goodnight. I'll put uh, the link to this music uh, in the description at some point. I'm from Canada, but I now live in Arizona. I went from very, very cold to very, very hot. Sorry. Poof. Yahweh, when he flooded everyone, he said, Sorry. Sorry, I flooded babies. Sorry, I flooded toddlers. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> 